start by uh, going somewhere. Where do you want to go? Name a city that is or was Muslim. What? Istanbul. It's exciting, right? It's cool. So what's going on here? So what's going on here? What is up with that? Well, I left the labels on. Yeah, but I can't see. Yeah, these are traditional markets. Actually, this whole place is one huge, enormous market. Who's been there? It's a very interesting place. What's going on here? And this is almost cheating. We shouldn't do as places you've been before, but we'll start here. Okay, good. So this is really, uh, the playing field is fairly level. Um, we're just trying to use our powers as architects to understand the world. So what can we understand because we're architects? Maybe that started out as like a central hill form, or not started, but eventually there was sort of a box of the white form, or, yeah, the white form, and then with, like, sort of, um, like, tents, or, out, or, I don't know what the word is, for, like, smaller vendors that are just sort of on the street. Lots of shops, like little places for shops. Yeah, and then that slowly developed into being more of a built form. Yeah. I did not expect that. I did not know you could do that. Go into the market like that. <laughs> Who's that? Who's that guy? <laughs> right, this is kind of amazing. So we're back out now. Um, yeah, so uh, Colin is um, speculating on the historic formation of this marketplace. Like, okay, thank you. Uh, that it started out um, as a bunch of stalls and shops and stores, and then it got formalized with hard structures. Like it might have been a bunch of uh, temporary structures. Um, what else can we know? That, that's like a reasonable speculation. What else can we speculate on? That residential was like built around it, so that way it was that yeah. and like the university are like sort of central focal points for the city. So let's look at uh, the stuff around it, and we have these clues from all these labels. It's tightly packed. It's very tight, and it's structured around these courtyards. And what do we know from the reading that might help us, give us a clue about how this works? Um, the street widths are like determined, or were determined by like epic economic value in the, like so the ones in the, uh, where like the houses are, are smaller because they're trying to have like a better social relationship. Yeah, and what else? I mean, where, what about issues of privacy? Um, s yeah, so what did we learn about privacy from the reading that helps uh, explain some things about the, the form? So this oblique view is not very well developed. I wonder if... Um,
Google Earth Pro will do any better. So let's name another city. Let's go to Fez. That's not Fez. Kuala Lumpur. That's a good one. This is the part of Fez I'm looking for. So what's going on here? So it would be, you'd be forgiven uh, if you said it's absolute chaos. It's absolute chaos, right? Who's with me? On the roof side of it, it sort of looks like the slums that we've been like, studying here. It kind of looks like the slums, right? Absolute chaos. Mm -hmm. You can still see really like almost linear streets, though, yeah. in the fabric of it. Yeah. It's just like no, there's not like a formal continuity, but there, it, I feel like there's a fabric to it, that makes sense. See, that's the thing. I'm going to say it looks like they're off that main road, but is that a road, or is that like a building? That that's is a, a building. That's a yeah. building. Yeah. So what, what do you think that building is? What's going on with that building? Should be a train. Um, this is probably a formalized shopping street because that is kind of the deal. Um, so kind of the key, if, uh, if there's nothing else that you take away from this topic, it's this, that when we start looking at things like this, and we, this happened when we were looking at informal settlements, it's chaos. It's absolutely random, total chaos, right? Until you recognize patterns. So pattern recognition. This is why artists and architects are being employed by the military to scour over intelligence photos. It's because we have the capacity to identify patterns uh, that computers can't even identify. And actually, the computer scientists are studying the way artists and architects identify, are able to identify patterns and trying to recreate that as an algorithm so that computers can be trained to recognize uh, patterns as well as and maybe someday better than artists and architects. So it's actually a fascinating thing. So what patterns do you guys recognize? And here's a hint, the reading. The reading is a cataloging of the forces that explain these forms. So this is the part of the class where we, uh, we can keep track of points if you want. And we can have a scoreboard. Um, and you can win points by associating forces and forms. You ready to play? And keep in mind, whoever goes first, Emma, will have an easier time because she gets to choose I should have just said, keep in mind that Emma is going to have a huge advantage over the rest of you because she's going to go to go first. Because she always goes first. Because the easiest forces are hers to pick up. One go. One of the forces is kind of like interaction. Show, show us a form and explain the form into a force. And you can stand up. Well. In like the city, kind of how it's laid out um, systematically mm -hmm. um, shows how even though it's so crammed, they man manage to make it functional for their for their urban for like the urban 
Be society. specific about function. What function are you seeing in this form? Like function of living, function of movement. Function of movement, let's go with that one. Show us a function of movement, a form that is function of movement. Kind of how like, the streets are. The streets are? In a grid. <laughs> the streets are in a grid where... <laughs> Like within the city, there's like, it seems like there's like more open space further on, but it kind of follows this large, I think it might be a street, is this a? It's a, it's a covered street, is my guess. Yeah. It's a covered street, but then it branches off into like these small condensed neighborhoods and then keeps branching off, so it kind of forms. Okay, point for Emma. Where? See how this game is played? There is no single, this is, how, this is mostly housing, right? There's not a single house here that you can't get to. So how do people get to these houses? The streets branch and branch and branch like capillary, uh, like a capillary system such that I can walk from outside of this district called the Kasbah or the Medina I can walk from outside the Medina into the Medina through the uh, ever-increasing smaller capillary streets and enter any single house in here if I'm invited. So there is a system of circulation that permeates throughout here even if you can't read it. But you could do that if we had um, a touch-sensitive screen or if I could write on this screen with my dry erase marker, we could trace, we could know that uh, every, every house in here has a circulation to get to it, and we could trace that on here. That's something that you can and, and maybe should do as part of your analysis. Okay, next contestant. Go ahead. Um, I can't really tell what this building is right here, mm -hmm. but it kind of looks like it's fortified. Like there's greenery over here, so there has to, it looks like there's like a wall right here and same mm -hmm. right here. Yeah. So that was my conclusion. Yeah. So there's a system of walled complexes yeah. that are probably some institutional big deal thing. And we can turn on the labels and see if that's true, um, probably. Although Fez, Morocco, is less likely to be fully labeled. And as we found in India, the government is going through and erasing the labels on whole parts of cities because they don't want people to get political power by showing up on the map. Isn't that interesting? So I'm not sure if Morocco has uh, wiped clean. Google is very cooperative of oppressive governments on this front. So next. There's a sort of uh, it's just like there's a correlation between where this covered street is, which we're assuming is a market, and then with this sort of avenue and where these which are must well that's kind of a giveaway that there's a mosque here and that's probably some other sort of public space. Yeah, um, so this is some big those. institution. That's a big institution. That's a big institution. That's and a major street. Might have generated sort of the rest of this and how it was sort of. So this is you're identifying primary structural elements. Mm -hmm. Like uh, you can kind of see the shopping street maybe cutting through to the, all the way to the other side, and then these large institutions. And you're seeing something here. I'm not sure what that is, but that looks similar to that. It could well be another shopping street. Or it could be part of a complex. But um, both are good guesses. Right? Another, okay, what else? Go ahead. You see through here as like common space to each of the site, like mm -hmm. one of those. There's one right here and one above here and one here. So like people with <coughs> residential can like gathering together. So you're reading that as shared public space. Mm -hmm. 
Um, does anyone have a counter possibility? Well, counter reading? I, maybe not a counter possibility, but like it seems like it's uh, spaced out where there's like denser areas almost, and there's like more green space almost where there's denser areas. Like mm -hmm. that whole right side has that entire like area to the right, mm -hmm. and then like over here where it's a little tucked into the bottom right, there's like mm -hmm. a green space right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's the deal. Um, we don't have parks. What we have are uh, public institutions that, <coughs> as a public surface, they offer spaces for the well-being of the people. So the mosque, the school, the municipality might, well, not, e not the municipality because it's really about the mosque. Um, uh, otherwise, it might just be an institution, a private institution, or a wealthy person with their garden. So it may or may not be public. But this over here is well, outside the wall. Well, wasn't there wasn't there a goal to have public space for everyone that's like accessible by everyone? Well, yeah, we'll see that in Isfahan, um, but not so much here. I was going to say, if this, is it possible? If like you zoomed out this image, maybe that green space separates um, like the different social classes of the city. Well, no. The cool thing about Fez is this is the old core of the city, uh, and it's not just the poor people. It's poor people, rich people. It's quite mixed. As a matter of fact, uh, since this is the most important mosque around, that um, and it's tilted to face. Mecca, uh, it, the, the most important uh, religious community is here. They live, this is, well, I'm not sure, is that the direction to Mecca? That one, that way is Mecca? From Morocco? Mm, I think it would be more tilted. I would expect it to go that way. Um, can you zoom into the dome of the mosque a little bit? Well, that's the mihrab. So it's faced upwards. Yeah. Well, north. And this is north? Yeah. This is the, the courtyard we come into. This yeah. is the, con the, the mm -hmm. hall with the prayer rugs. But this is... Yeah, this is the very guy. The prayer. imam is leading the prayers yeah. and giving the Friday, yeah. the Friday sermon. Yeah. So, and in Islam, we and I, I'm saying we. This is a professional ethical stance of architecture. Just like when I say we students, I'm I'm being empathetic. I'm I'm placing myself as best I can in the role of the students when I say we don't have time for this class. Um, now I'm doing the same thing, and this is a professional ethical method where to understand the users of this architecture, we place ourselves as best we can in the position of the users. We in Islam, I'm not Muslim, uh, but, I, but as a professional, I'm obligated to say we in Islam um, face Mecca. We, and we go to the Friday mosque, Friday at noon, that's our. That's the equivalent of Sunday morning in Islam. Sunday morning church, Friday noon sermon, Friday noon, um, Friday prayers. So we in Islam we pray five times. Is anyone Muslim? I am. Okay. So we in Islam are supposed to pray five times a day, although we don't always, right? Because two of them are in the middle of the night. Um, so we're supposed to pray five times a day. We're supposed to face Mecca. Uh, we're also obligated to travel to Mecca if we are able to. If we have the means, we are obligated once during our lifetime to travel to Mecca uh, on the Hajj. Uh, and so, and five times a day we face Mecca and do our prayers. Friday noon, it's a special time of the week, we go to the Friday prayer mosque, the Friday mosque. Uh, which is the main mosque in the area. Otherwise, if I'm at school here, I go to the prayer room in Beatty Hall to do my, to
to uh, do my five daily, you know, whichever one falls like at sunset. I go, I go to Beatty Hall, where is the place given to us for prayer, right? Um, so that's the system, and this is the architecture of that system. And the devout are more likely to be here. Often there's a cemetery, so you are simultaneously uh, facing Mecca and the revered holy people who have died. Um, so these are some of the forces that account for these forms. Other forms and forces for us to look for? How does this help with like military activity? Like defining these patterns? Um, well, I can tell not knowing these patterns uh, has an impact on military activity. Have you ever heard the word Fallujah? Fallujah. Who's heard the word Fallujah? What's Fallujah? It's a city in Iraq. Why have we heard of Fallujah? Why is it famous? Terrorism. It became, it became a hotbed of terrorism, but before it was a hotbed of terrorism, it was one of the most peaceful, organized cities of the entire, it was a success story of the Iraqi invasion because there was no hostility there. But because the military did not have anyone who graduated from this course uh, to talk to, when they went into Fallujah to just, you know, just make sure everything was cool, they went to the school and they went up on the roof and they set up a, a post uh, and a, a machine gun nest. And so they have all these young men soldiers up on the roof of the school. Why is that a problem, given what you read in the reading? I think the Muslims sort of took that as like a, a sort of that breaking point of all. We read something in the reading that would tell us why the military should not have gone to the roof of the school to set up an observation post. Why would that be offensive? Hmm? Does that go against like Muslim principles? Or what principle does it go against? Um, social well being. Wait, Fallujah has been destroyed, so there's not much to look at. So um, what happens is um, the rooftops are where people sleep at night, including women. And uh, you're not allowed to, so it's absolutely forbidden that you overlook someone else's roof. That's just, I think it says that in the reading, right? You're not allowed to see onto someone else's roof. Um, and so to put a bunch of young uh, infidels on the rooftop of the school to have visual access to everybody's roof is a problem. And so uh, there were do a dozen or more infractions of that sort, of just normal common sense law of being civilized in Fallujah. It's like, you just. You don't spit on people, and you don't look on everybody's roofs. It's kind of a similar thing. So uh, some, there were some protests against uh, the US military doing these things, taking over mosques, uh, looking down from school rooftops. And uh, during one of these protests, it was a peaceful protest march, someone fired a weapon, and the US military just opened fire and shot a lot of people who were in that protest. Then Fallujah became the most uh, bloodiest location of the Iraq war because the fighters came from all over to fight the US forces in Fallujah. It became a, a, a flashpoint of the war. So the question was, what, how does this help the military? Well, it would help the, it would help. We stopped that. <laughs> it would have prevented all of that. A lot of people died in Fallujah. Um, so that's where it helps. So there's not much left to look at in Fallujah. Is this rebuilt or Could we get to this? old 
because the fabric looks completely different. Yeah. It doesn't go to Street View because the car ain't going to go through there. Yeah, it looks like Street View. Well, again, Google is very cooperative. I don't know. Um, yeah, sorry, Fallujah. But um, let's look at some other things. So my colleague who taught this course last semester uh, put together some beautiful slides. So let's just look at some of that. Um, that can help us understand. So this is to make the point, looks like chaos, but it's actually very uh, clear outcome of forces and forms. And if you're able to decipher the form-force relationships in the Islamic city, you've got a huge head start on deciphering other force-form relationships, like coral reefs, like informal settlements, like other natural patterns that we find in the world, it becomes hugely uh, useful to be able to identify patterns and start to figure out what forces account for those patterns. So Islam expanded uh, out of Mecca uh, in stages. And one of my favorite things is to look at how the uh, everywhere Islam went, it Look, it took the, for, the forms that were there in the culture and it said, okay, let's take this church in, in Constantinople and when we become Istanbul, what church became a mosque? Thank you. I'm so happy you said that. Um, and uh, it then became the... Uh, quintessential it became the quintessential uh, mosque form um, as Hagia Sophia became uh, the prototype for all mosques at that point this one Alhambra Fez uh, where's Istanbul Damascus Sorry, I'm going to go to Istanbul. Here we go. This is Bukhara. Here's Istanbul. Um, so Hagia Sophia became the, the prototype for all mosques that followed. You recognize this, right? Uh, so Hagia Sophia, which is no longer a mosque, uh, it's no longer a church or a mosque, it's now a museum, but it became the prototype of mosques all over the region. Um, so this is not Hagia Sophia, but it's got the same half dome arrangements of uh, Hagia Sophia. And it became the quintessential mosque form that was replicated throughout uh, the, air, the region. And uh, it's got the forecourt, and it's got the hall, it's got the mihrab uh, aimed towards Mecca. This looks like um, a restoration plan. And uh, it's associated with all kinds of corollary uh, institutions. So the madrasa is the school. And associated with every mosque, every important Friday mosque, is the madrasa. Uh, and in addition to the madrasa school for young men, there's also um, a caravanserai for traders. So traders, uh, the trade network of the Muslim world really created this series of way stations for traders to travel from city to city to city, and there was always a place for them to stay and to uh, maintain their practices as required by Islam. Islam is a, is a quintessentially urban religion 
uh, in that uh, in order to be a good Muslim, we need the people around us. We need the ummah. We need the community of true believers who are there to support us. We need our buddies. Friends don't let friends uh, fall out of the practices. And so we support each other uh, to continue the practices. And so when, when a young man enters puberty, he needs special attention because there are lots of temptations out there. And so you put him in the madrasa. When people are traveling for trade, you give them a, a home base, even though they're far away from home, because we, this is all part of sustaining and supporting the continuity of proper practices uh, and clinics. Uh, and so these are all the institutions that are associated with the mosque. And it becomes a complex system that is a spatial system. And so here you see that same mosque that we were viewing from here. So you see uh, the institutional arrangements around the mosque that are all those elements that we need to keep maintain the practices of this. So it's a, it's, it's a more complete system. And then there's the marketplace, which is also associated with the mosque. There's uh, beyond, if you're moving from the mosque, away from the mosque, uh, you're, you first hit the madrasa, then you hit the market. And the covered markets uh, are really remarkable. Um, but we should look at Isfahan quickly. And there's uh, some really interesting ways of drawing these, uh, these fabrics. Klaus Herdeg was a... Um, architect uh, who practiced in Boston, then he taught at Columbia, and he took his students uh, to draw these, these, uh, these fabrics, these urban fabrics, where uh, there's the mosque, the madrasa, uh, the mausoleum, and the other institutions that surround the mosque. Um, this is his work in Isfahan. And this is the bazaar. So we start to recognize the stores uh, in relationship to the residences off of the, the, the shopping streets. More Isfahan in Iran. But once you start to see the patterns, and once you understand the importance of privacy, um, so in the United States, we have this mythology that uh, where homes are surrounded by the wilderness. Uh, and so we access light and air by looking out from the homes. And as the wilderness uh, becomes suburbs, <laughs> the boundaries uh, become smaller and smaller. Until you get to um, the inner suburbs like Queens or Brighton, where the wilderness becomes extremely small. Five foot setbacks uh, and side yards. Um, and then, uh, but in the, the forms uh, of this part of the world, you see the opposite. You see uh, protective walls around the outside, unpunctured except on one of these four walls, there's going to be a street. And the street might be wide, the street might be very narrow. And so there's uh, passage through here, but even here, visual access is controlled. And you get access to light and air by opening your living spaces to the courtyard. Does that make sense? So in a way, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. It's a flipping of the figure ground of the North American tradition. And when things get tighter and tighter, uh, the courtyard is still there, but the courtyard gets smaller and smaller. And instead of having rooms arranged on all four sides of the courtyard, sometimes uh, in extreme conditions, you just get a room in front of and a room behind the courtyard. 
Um, and so it's a very interesting pattern to the cities, but it is a pattern. And it's a pattern that you can decipher uh, if you understand the forces and the patterns. The patterns of circulation, the requirements of privacy dictate uh, these forms. And there's another, um, just as uh, the veil, the, the covering of the hair and the veil for women, uh, it, it translates architecturally into the privacy of the second floors and the privacy of the rooftops. You're not allowed to look on someone else's rooftop. And uh, the women, uh, there are, there's spatial segregation. Uh, women don't go in all the spaces of the house, and men don't go in all the spaces of the house. The upstairs tends to be female. The downstairs tend to be male. Towards the entryway tends to be male. Away from the entryway tends to be female. And these are uh, social forces that manifest as architectural forms at the scale of the clothing, at the scale of the room, at the scale of the floor plan, at the scale of the street, at the scale of the city. And so it's a really interesting hierarchy of forms that, that translate very directly to social norms and forces and rules and regulations. Um, and I think I just want to make one other point. But do you have any questions about this stuff? So let me go to this. There's some beautiful, beautiful stuff here. So Damascus is another city recently destroyed by warfare, but it was one of the great capitals of uh, Islam. And again, all of these patterns are playing into it. And so what's going on here? What was the name of the city? Damascus which is in Syria. It looks like the land rises or falls. If you look at me, if you look like right, like right where you pointed, uh -huh. in the middle, mm -hmm. right there, it looks like there's like contour lines, almost. Um, yeah, that's more of an optical illusion. I don't think that steps down. All right. But how is this, first of all, you see the mosque, right? And you see, you see these domes around a courtyard. You see these domes. Um, you can start to read larger in institutions. This might be the madrasa. Uh, you, there's probably a shopping street. This is probably a shopping street. It's not covered, but sometimes it was covered. Sometimes it was not covered. Um, it almost looks like there's like a transformation of how the city works, like going from right to left. It sort yeah. of looks like traditional, and then the more you move to the left of that mosque, yeah, it looks like it starts turning into like a, a present day city. Yeah, so it would have been centered on this, and the mosque was transformed multiple times uh, to be expanded as the population, as Damascus became, that doesn't the Damascus of trade, uh, which is a way of saying the mo one of the most important trading centers of any uh, in the world for centuries. But it, it would have expanded in this way. But something happened over here. Like the wall could have been here. Well, there's a covered shopping street. Bingo. Right? Covered shopping street. But this is a French fragment. The width of the streets, the, the, the nature of the buildings, Houseman's Paris, right? Look at that. The courtyard, the, the Baroque centeredness of these primary streets centered on the courtyard. And so increasingly, you see things like this, where you, read, you can read uh, the, the age of the place and actually read into it and see what's going on. And we'll see more of that next week. Uh, I think he's talking about like the open. This one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know, but it looks a lot like uh, 
like a ruler's palace. Like this could be well, higher. Like, it could be a citadel structure. Are those sky <coughs> mid rises at the bottom side of that? It uh, looks like they come above a lot of other. Yeah. So these this uh, reads as fortifications. So this I'm going to call this the citadel. And so it would have sat on the wall surrounding the core of Damascus. Let's go back one. So you can see the walled city of Damascus prior to further expansion. And the citadel would sit uh, on the wall uh, at the most likely approach from, from afar, which is probably this street. There would be a big gate there leading to the main mosque. And you can tell where the gates of the city were because uh, things radiate, radiate out from wherever the gate would have been. We'll see that more next, next week. But there was a gate here, and we know that because this major street changes direction when it hits the gate and enters the city. Isn't that interesting? It's great entertainment value when you are traveling with other people and you're able to read into the form certain moments of history and they say, wow, how did you know that? But here's the analysis of the structural elements of the town. You see the, uh, the covered marketplace um, and some of the institutions related to the mosque, the madrasa, uh, etc. And then this should be identified as well, the citadel is part of that structure of the early city. And seeing it in this view is even um, more telling and more interesting. And the, uh, some of the larger houses, so this is, this is one home, and the courtyard for that home is this lush, lavish garden, cool, there's usually a water element uh, in it, um, and it can be quite lovely and lavish. Let's look at... So one of the things um, in Islam, uh, it changes so much. And I wish I could show you, uh, I showed you how Hagia Sophia went from church to mosque and then became the prototypical mosque. A similar thing happened throughout Southeast Asia where the Hindu Javanese roof forms of, uh, that you see in Bali now, uh, because Bali is still Hindu, Java became Muslim, uh, that the roof forms of the Hindu Javanese uh, practices of architecture became the mosque form. And that's the form of the mosque throughout Southeast Asia, through Malaysia, uh, parts of Thailand, um, uh, it's the the Javanese mosque form just kind of took over in a, in a way that's very similar to the way Hagia Sophia became the prototype. Another uh, aspect of this is the, in Islam, uh, figurative art is to be avoided. It's not, it's absolutely forbidden to represent the prophet uh, Muhammad uh, as a figure because it's disrespectful. And human form in general uh, is disrespectful. So the artwork of Islam, there are exceptions, of course, uh, in India especially, um, where Persianate, uh, northern India and in Persia, uh, the artwork uh, was rich in figurative form. But this is the core calligraphy of Quranic verses becomes the core of uh, the aesthetic of Islam. And it goes from graphic and in a remarkable transformation that the computer scientists are still trying to figure out. It goes from two dimensions to three dimensions. And we mentioned it in the past that if not for the science, uh, the sciences that Islam uh, kept going while Europe was in its so-called dark ages, um, we would not have Greek philosophy. We would not have the Bible itself. Uh, a lot of these things survived because of the great libraries and the centers of scientific learning uh, of Islam. And uh, 
the transformation of these graphic patterns into three dimensions uh, is something that architects have been fascinated by, especially computer architects driven by computer algorithm um, research are still trying to figure it out. Uh, but the results are truly remarkable. Uh, we have no time for that. The Madrasa of Isfahan is one of the great This is Baghdad. And uh, they basically said, let's make the ultimate city devoted to Islam. And this is what they came up with. Um, there's nothing left of it. Um, as often the case, uh, it's just archaeological patterns on the ground. Cairo, uh, la la, the back of that. And the last thing we should look at is the Alhambra, which is in Granada, Spain, which helps us understand why Latin America looks the way it looks. This is a recent um, expansion uh, of history where we recognize that uh, from the 8th century until the time of Christopher Columbus, uh, Spain and Portugal was Muslim. Uh, so that was a seven, uh, over 750-year seven, period where Spain was uh, a mixed society of Catholics, Muslims, but it was really controlled politically by uh, the caliphate. And uh, it explains why, if you look in a Spanish dictionary, how big is the A section? It's huge. That's because of all the Arabic terms that have found their way into Spanish. And uh, if looking at these courtyards um, uh, that we're just looking at, it says, oh, that looks, I think I stayed in a place like that in uh, Cartagena when I was visiting. Well, it's because uh, this stuff all got embedded in Spanish architectural practices to the point where we see uh, Islamic form throughout Latin America now, uh, and we recognize it as Islamic instead of saying that it's Spanish. We see it as Islamic form that came via the Spanish uh, colonial forces. So this is the Alhambra um, in Spain. So maybe that's enough. So any questions about this, this stuff? So forces and forms, and seeing patterns in what other people would call chaos. This is what we like about this topic. OK? All right, do you guys have reviews today? Yes. Good luck. Oh, really? Yeah. We have a discussion, and he said that Who's, who's your teacher? JP. Really? He's such a good guy. He's such a good guy. I like all of I think my favorite teacher though, for a studio have been Calvert and Ballard. Oh, thank you. I've never heard of this. But, uh, Professor Powers, thank you. Yeah, NJ is amazing, isn't he? Yeah, he's super smart. Oh my god. He's such a good guy. He's a great guy.